Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Codes That Safeguard Buildings Under Construction. My name is Marcy Weber, and I'll be the education team moderator for today's presentation. Today's webinar is going to run one and one half hour. Today's speaker is our very own manager of fire service relations, Ray Obraki. We then have a quick disclaimer. Please note that this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. Here is our speaking, um, our speaker, Ray Obraki, and Lori Cook, our Director of Educational Outreach, myself, Marcy Weber, Manager of Education and Accreditation, and Kim Paulson, our behind the scenes magician um, and education administrator administrator. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you off to Ray. My name is Ray Brocky, as Marcy said. I'm with the American Wood Council. I, um, before coming with the American Wood Council, I uh, was in the Baltimore City Fire Department for 23 years. I was the assistant chief of that department when I retired. I was the fire marshal before that. I was the fire official. And uh, after that, I was the chief building official for the city of Rockville, Maryland. So <clears throat> I tell you that not just because of telling you who I am, I tell you because I uh, come at this from uh, two angles, that of a building official and that of a fire official, uh, which is material to this discussion because I wanna talk about the gap between uh, responsibilities with what uh, building officials, how they look at this issue, and how fire officials look at this issue. This is just a course description uh, of what we're going to talk about today, what we're trying to get at. This is a, a, for a broad-based audience. These are our learning objectives. We're going to look at the risk and hazards on construction sites. We're going to look at the model codes that govern uh, these construction sites. We're going to look at fire safety plans. We're going to look at best practices and what some of these codes cover. Um, and uh, we're also going to talk a little bit. This is the Construction Fire Safety Coalition. I'm the administrator of it. It's a it's free to qualified officials. It's just a public public private partnership trying to reduce the occasion of construction site fires and the severity when they do occur. There's template uh, fire safety plans on there and different resources. This is just a companion Facebook page uh, that if you want to post something on there or ask a question and get it answered in real time. So uh, the nature of the fire problem in the United States when it comes to construction site fires. Uh, this is a report done by Richard Campbell of the National Fire Protection Agency. It, basically about 3,840 fires occur in sites under construction every year. About 2,500 uh, fires occur in places under uh, renovation. Uh, it sounds like big numbers. It's only really about 1% of all structure fires in the country. The, the fire problem in this country still is one in two family dwellings. Doesn't mean it's not important or a problem. It just means I'm just trying to put it in perspective. But they are really big. They're really big fires and they do a disproportionate amount of uh, damage, uh, economic loss to the community too. And this is just a slide to say that uh, even though fire is uh, only one twelfth of all claims in total. The loss from fire claims are uh, three times as big as water not from flooding losses are. <clears throat> so I just want to review some significant fires that have taken place in recent history, um, just to get an idea of you know what we're dealing with. So the first fire that I'd like to uh, talk about occurred uh, back in 2020, January of 2020 to be specific. And that occurred in Boundbrook, New Jersey. This is not far from uh, New York. It was in a 174 unit apartment building. This was four stories of wood frame over top of a two story concrete cast in place podium. It was a seven alarm fire. What had happened, what made this unique is, <clears throat> if you see in that bottom picture there, the fire actually jumped that big wide street and, and put uh, uh, the radiant heat caught the construction site across the street on fire as well. This was ruled an arson fire. Uh, a person broke into the place on that left hand side and actually uh, lit it on fire. Uh, the place went up very, very quickly. It was very lax security, had a lot of scrap in it. Denver, Colorado, a couple years ago, I put this in here because it was one of the rare fires 
where somebody was actually killed. It was also a rare fire because it happened during the middle of the day. <clears throat> this was a fire. They never found a definitive fire cause on it. They think it was uh, improper fueling of equipment because the two people that were actually killed were in the vicinity of the area of origin, but they couldn't rule out everything else. So they, uh, they, they had to leave it undetermined. The next fire was in College Park, Maryland. This actually shut down the University of Maryland College Park. This had to do with um, uh, debris was in a shaft space and they think somebody dropped the cigarette in the shaft space, caught the debris on fire. The takeaway from this one was the sprinkler system was installed, but it wasn't yet operational. The other thing was it had a uh, standpipe system, but the standpipe was an operational. The fire department didn't know it. So they um, hooked up to it and they were pumping it, but it wasn't conveying water upstairs. So they wasted a lot of time unnecessarily, not knowing that it wasn't hooked up. So it burned the roof off the place. That was a total loss. This was Fairfax County, Virginia. Um, this place was a really big place. I have a video at the end of this presentation, if we have time to play it, <clears throat> that um, where this was a combustible garbage chute. And uh, it was supposed to have a recessed head at the top of it didn't have that recess head at the top it caught fire and it burned up this uh, front of this building right into a unit and the unit was still framed out they didn't have the jet board on it so uh, it was a total total loss uh, there's a, one more fire i want to look at oakland california this was uh, called the waverly the reason i put this in here is that this involved a construction crane. The, the thermal column was so hot that the construction crane started to spin like a top that created a collapse hazard. The fire department had to pull back uh, on it. So that a, a really big place, also a total loss. So I always <clears throat> think of construction site fire safety in terms of the three-legged stool of effective firefighting. You need fire department access, you need water supply and you need early notification. You need all three or the stool can't stand. It doesn't matter if you have fire department access, if you have no water supply. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have water supply, but you can't get close enough to put it on there. It doesn't matter if you have water supply and you have access, but you don't have early notification. So by the time you get there, the place is too far gone to save it. You need all three or the three legged stool will not stand. So construction sites are dangerous places. It's no real mystery why. <clears throat> There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of uh, people doing their own thing. You have hazardous materials, you have uh, hot work and hazardous processes. You have sources of ignition, like smoking materials, cooking, open flames. You have electrical, you have temporary wiring. Um, you have a lot of sources of ignition. And then in the same vicinity of all these sources of ignition, you also have sources of fuel, you have combustible refuse and trash, uh, building materials, you know, you have hazmats like uh, uh, flammable liquids and gases. And, and uh, <clears throat> so you have a lot of uh, sources of fuel, you have a lot of sources of ignition. So uh, you don't have to worry about it in wooden buildings, correct, right? You know, like here's the Hilton Tower that's being remodeled in Columbus, Ohio, type one building. You know, you don't have anything to worry about here, right? It's all, it's all, you know, non-combustible materials. So you, you, don't, you don't have to worry about it, right? This was in Columbus, Ohio this past winter when I was up there giving a, uh, a presentation. I walked around back and bam. So don't be fooled even with type one buildings. There's still combustible materials in there. You know, you know cast in place concrete still uses wooden forms. You still have uh, packing materials. You still have... Uh, vinyl tub kits, uh, you know, you, you still have combustibles. There was a fire in Brooklyn a couple months ago, Brooklyn, New York, uh, that was a type one building that, that was a, a couple alarm fire. So you, you, just because it's a, it's a type one or two building, don't think that you can't have a fire. So according to that same study that Richard Campbell from NFPA did, these are some of the causes or the leading causes of uh, fire, construction site fires. Cooking is number one at 22%, and then you have electrical heating and intentionally set fires at, at those various percentages. Sometimes cooking comes as a shock to some people. <clears throat> and um, But don't put a lot of weight in those percentages per se. 
Uh, sometimes the numbers can be misleading. Yes, cooking is number one, but those uh, fires are usually minor in nature. So even though it makes up 22% of the fire causes, it really only makes up about 3% of the property loss. Now, electrical fires account for 16% of all the construction site fires, but they do 42% of the property damage. Uh, intentionally set, make up 11%, but make up 32% of the property damage. So even though um, cooking makes up 22% and electrical fires, intensely set fires combined 27%, they do about uh, three quarters of the property loss for uh, construction site fires. We also know when these fires usually occur and to no one's surprise, <clears throat> these fires usually occur in colder months. They occur frequently in colder months because you know people want to stay warm. So there's a proliferation of burn barrels and a proliferation of space heaters. And the peak times are <clears throat> 1,600 hours to 2,100 hours. Uh, and even though only 12% occur between midnight and four, the majority of the property loss occurs between midnight and four. That's the really bad fires. So what you can glean from that is the fires occur most of the time when nobody's there because there's, you know, when they occur with people there, it doesn't take a, a rocket science to, 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 to know that people put them out. If they occur when people are there, but people are there to put them out. And these are some of the leading factors contributing to the ignition, you know, electrical failures, abandoned, discarded materials, and heat sources too close to um, <clears throat> combustible materials. So fires that occur during major renovations, uh, the percentages are a little bit different than for new construction, but you see all the usual suspects there, electrical, heating, intentionally set fires, cooking, are all still, um, still there. Uh, so now that we know the causes, we can mitigate the hazards because I, you know, no matter what, a situation you have, there's always going to be a hazard. So you're never going to, you're never, ever, ever, ever not going to have a hazard. It, so you have to mitigate the hazards. That's how you, you prevent fires. And I get asked, well, you know, what teeth do I have? I get asked by building departments, fire departments, you know, what do, what can I do? There are codes and standards that govern um, sites while they're under construction. And everybody has a role and a responsibility in construction site safety. Okay, so the model codes that safeguard construction and they touch every part of this country are as follows. <clears throat> now, there's two major codes, uh, fire codes in this country, which is the International Fire Code and NFPA 1. Uh, there, every jurisdiction in this country uses one or the other as the model fire code for their jurisdiction. And pretty much the entire country, with rare exception, uses the International Building Code. But the grandfather, well, and let me go back. Chapter 33 of the IFC deals with construction site fire safety. NFPA 1 Chapter 16 deals with construction site fire safety. Chapter 33 of the IBC deals with construction site safety. Doesn't really have a whole lot in there about fire safety, but it references the IFC. But the grandfather of all of these when it comes to construction fire safety is NFPA 241, which is a standard. Now, it's not uh, a new standard. It has actually been around for a pretty long time. It is uh, it was adopted back in 1933. It's not an overly uh, large uh, standard. It's less than 40 pages. It's not an uh, overly technical standard. <clears throat> so even if you are an NFPA 1 fire code jurisdiction, NFPA 241 would still apply to you, if you even if you adopt the IFC, because the IFC in Chapter 33 adopts 241 by reference. It references it. It says if there is a requirement in NFPA 241 that is not covered 
in this code that the requirement in 241 shall apply. <clears throat> uh, and because the IBC references the IFC, which represents 241, then it would apply. So <clears throat> you do have a legal, there is a legal uh, pathway to compliance if you uh, choose to enforce it. So everybody has a uh, responsibility, starting with the owner. Uh, they, they have a responsibility to create a culture of fire safety. They have a responsibility to work with the authority having jurisdiction to create a, pr a plan together. Um, uh, they have a, uh, they, they are the ultimate responsible party when it comes to fire safety and safety in general on a construction site. And they are responsible for creating a fire safety program. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to read from every slide, but I'm going to read from this one. NFP 241 says a fire safety program shall be included in all, all, construction, alteration, or demolition contracts, and the right of the owner to administer and enforce this program shall be established even if the building is entirely under the jurisdiction of the contractor, okay? So <clears throat> this states that every construction uh, project is supposed to have a fire safety program. Now, should a jurisdiction make you know, John Q. Public, who's building a deck on the back of his house, uh, have a fire safety program with a fire prevention program manager. No, that's, you know. So I would say common sense would dictate that you would maybe scope this somewhat, or at least make them, uh, if you're going to have them do something, have maybe have a one pager sort of uh, educational thing. But NFPA does say all. So, but for, uh, but uh, the other part of this, the owner can't say, well, the GC is, uh, he has this site, so it's on him or her. Nope, he can delegate the responsibility, they can't delegate the accountability. So the owner, even if the uh, contractor has the site, the owner is the ultimate um, uh, party that is accountable for fire safety on that site. And they have to appoint a program manager to manage the fire safety program. And the, the uh, program manager has responsibilities. And you can see the responsibilities here. They, they should train the, their personnel in the use of fire protection equipment, which would really mean extinguishers. They would develop a pre-fire plan with the local fire department. They would be uh, doing weekly self-inspections. They would be responsible for the guard service. And, and you can you know, read a lot of uh, what's going on with uh, these responsibilities. They would also uh, you know, uh, help develop the plan and, and all that good stuff. Employees also have responsibilities here. And mainly uh, their responsibilities are to obey the rules and wear their proper protective gear and all this good stuff and and uh, report any hazards they see and use their uh, tools properly and and also the visitors to job sites have a responsibility to also wear their PPE and remain visible and and to be safe and uh, so I want to go back one I skipped a slide there um, about the AHJ's responsibility so the authority having jurisdiction is sort of a team, uh, a team effort. So the building department, they, they have a responsibility of inspecting the construction. The fire prevention bureau or fire marshal's office, they have the responsibility of ins inspecting the, sometimes they do fire inspections as the building's constructed not that many usually may pump inspection they usually start inspecting more as the building's done uh and the fire suppression division they inspect they, they don't really inspect they do pre-event planning or pre-incident planning they'll look for uh evaluate the water supply and they, they kind of just do sh strategy and tactics if something were to happen but here's the problem when it comes to construction fire safety Building inspectors think, I don't need to 
worry about construction fire safety because that's what the fire inspectors do. I worry about the building code. I go in there, I look at the approved plans, I apply MEP codes, I look at what's built, and that fire stuff is in the fire code, and I look at what's in the building code. Well, the fire inspectors, they go, wait a minute, we don't go on new construction sites, we don't look at new construction, that's the building guys. We don't even have a permit for new construction. <clears throat> so while the building guys are pointing to the fire guys, and the fire guys are going, wait, well, the fire code's a maintenance code, we go into finished buildings. So nobody's watching. And it's not because the fire inspectors are lazy, and it's not because the building inspectors are lazy or, lazy or negligent. It's they're just retreating into their traditional roles. And because building uh, inspections are permit driven and fire inspections are permit driven or complaint driven, there's no administrative mechanism to really trigger construction fire safety inspections. And I've been on both sides of it. I've been in building departments and I've been in fire marshal's office. So I think that's why, um, that's, that's why this is a challenge uh, because of this, what I call responsibility gap. So um, how we solve it is things like this, just to raise awareness of it. So, but every job site is supposed to have a fire safety pro program and the fire safety program is supposed to have a fire, a construction fire safety plan and it's supposed to be submitted and approved by the fire department. So all the following issues should be addressed in the fire safety program, like housekeeping and on-site security. I'm not going to go through every one on this list because we're going to go through every one individually over the next um, probably you know hour. So <clears throat> the elements of a good fire safety program, you know, uh, and and it's required in both NFPA 241 Chapter 7 and in the IFC Chapter 33. Um, and they would include the organizational structure and responsibility for fire safety. You would want contact names and numbers of the people responsible for the uh, compliance with the fire prevention plan. You would want um, arrangements for recording uh, fire safety training, and then you would want a risk assessment uh, and FPE reports. Now, obviously, this wouldn't be for small tenant fit outs. It would be for more complex structures or structures that are important to the community, fire safety requirements and compliance with applicable fire or building codes. And then really important procedures for emergency notification, evacuation, and relocations of persons in the building under construction. So you want to have accountability for the personnel if um, you know something were to happen. So you can tell the fire department whether everybody's gotten out or not. Um, and you also would want um, procedures for hot work. You would want um, uh, electrical uh, supplies and equipment. You would want a policy for that. You want a smoking policy. You would want um, a cooking or non-cooking policy. You know, th things along those lines that we're going to discuss. Um, you'd also want something addressed about fire protection provisions where you could keep people up to date or keep people, keep the fire service up to date on the disposition of your fire protection so they know if the stand pipe is in service uh, or, you know, make sure it's going up with the building and, and if the sprinkler system is on in certain areas so they know. So we're going to go over some best practices and some code requirements. The reason that I discuss best practices, even though they may be above the code, is because sometimes they find their way into the code. Uh, also, if for those who are listening that are um, uh, are AHJs, you can always uh, amend your own local code. Not always. Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can't. But site security has taken on a greater importance. Uh, guard services shall be provided when required by the authority having jurisdictions, a jurisdiction. Security fences shall be provided where required by the authority having jurisdiction. Entrances to structures uh, must be secured. So the default setting here is you don't need it unless the AHJ requires it. Well, there's a new provision in 241 that says combustible construction 
um, exposed uh, more than 40 feet above grade plane, you have to a guard service is required. That's in the 2019 241. So it's 40 feet above grade plane, you have to put uh, a, a guard service in there only on hours when workers aren't there. And as part of your overall fire, uh, your fire, your construction fire safety plan, you have to have a site security plan. And that site security plan should contain the following, you know, uh, personal observation, scheduled patrols, if you have a guard service, the guard service has to be trained on notification procedures, how to use um, extinguishers and, and all that stuff. And, and guard services are important because I track multifamily uh, construction fires. And in 2020, there were 24 of them. Out of the 24, they had 16 reported in the media as suspicious. So a lot of times uh, builders don't see the value in putting up fencing. And I get it in infill lots, it's a challenge to fence off a property but uh, they always seem to put up a fence after the fire. This was a, a garden apartment in Long Neck, Delaware. Uh, I, I try to visit some of these sites when I can. So I, I got there because I, I, I don't live that far away. So I show up as the building is literally still smoldering from the night before and they're putting a fence up and they actually have two other garden apartments, one to the left of this photo, one to the right of this photo and they're fencing this one off. And I asked the fire investigator that was still on the scene, I said, well, can you tell me what happened? And he said, yeah, some folks came out of that tree line into the back of this place while it was under construction and they were inside messing around and we don't know what exactly they were doing, but they started the fire. So uh, I, a lot of times they, they go in there to scrap copper and they burn the wire off and that catches fire or they, it's chilly at night or they start a fire for warmth or they're doing drugs and so who knows. But uh, there were two other garden departments and I went up to the superintendent. I said, so you're gonna fence the other two off? And the guy told me no. And I said, well, why are you fencing this one off and not the other two? And he said, well, we don't have to fence the other two off. We have to fence this one off because it's a dangerous site. So sometimes it's hard to convince corporate leadership that the importance of site security and perimeter security. They think it messes with their site logistics and they, they are worried about uh, extra costs on the site, but um, sometimes they're a little penny wise and pound foolish. And like I said, in infill lots, it can be a challenge. Here's some final thoughts on site security. You might want um, real fencing instead of weighted base fencing. You might want signage and artificial intelligence. So, um, Another thing in 241, it talks about separation distances. Uh, the only, this is probably the most technical thing in 241 about uh, separation distances from temporary structures. They have a table, this is just an excerpt from the table. Uh, 20 feet of temporary structure exposing wall length needs to be 30 feet away from the building under construction. But you get a 75% reduction if it's sprinklered, if the temporary structure is sprinklered. Now, in, a, in an urban setting, or you're not going to get 30 feet. You just try to keep it as far away as possible if you can. I mean, it's uh, in LA, LA City, they just say keep it as far away as you can. So, uh, housekeeping is another big thing, and housekeeping rules are not the same as housekeeping activity. Things can go south very quickly if the um, if the supervisors don't enforce what uh, what they have on their books. They all have rules, but if they don't enforce it, what good are the rules? And I always tell the story about when I was remodeling my house, I uh, pulled down some old ductwork and I found a KSC bag and a Taco Bell bag in the ductwork. And I, you know, hypothesized that it was probably the, the workers that were in there working the last time the house had been remodeled and they shoved their lunch trash in there instead of finding a trash can. And that was just a, just a row house in South Baltimore. And, <clears throat> and could you imagine on a big construction site, uh, the, you know, the workers have maybe 30 minutes. They're not gonna walk around looking for a trash can. They're going to 
they're gonna they're gonna shove it in, a, in some kind of a shaft space, and that's coincidentally the same place where people take their cigarette butts and put them when they're trying to not get caught smoking. And that's probably what happened in College Park. But NFPA one, they talk about clearing all their waste at the end of the day and, and sweeping up. And the problem is that construction managers really don't get bonuses for keeping a clean job site. They get bonuses for things like getting done under budget, on time or uh, under schedule and that kind of thing. But you do wanna keep uh, spaces around uh, your stored material. You wanna make sure uh, open top dumpsters are empty or at least moved away from the structure at the end of every shift and that kind of thing. And you don't want to block sprinkler heads. And and uh, I remember uh, we had a hotel in the one jurisdiction where I worked and and uh, we had already inspected the basement and they had locked it off and we were inspecting the rest of the hotel. And then I had to go back to the basement one time. And, and uh, in the meantime, they had brought all these mattresses and they had it stacked up all the way in the basement to the to the sprinkler heads and it was crazy. Hot work is uh, something that needs to be permitted, but not permitted in the way that you may think, not in a not in a governmental way. It's sort of a a internal process. They have a standard for it, NFPA 51B, that uh, governs hot work. And uh, I think everybody knows the definition of hot work. It's work involving, involving burning, welding, or similar operation that's capable of initiating fire explosions. And there's two different areas that you would talk about, a designated area, which is an area that is designed for hot work, which is like a workshop or a temporary, say, trailer that's made for a workshop. And then basically, uh, uh, permit area is everywhere else that's not designed for it. So uh, it's an internal program, like I said, it's an area that you would, on the job site, if you wanna do hot work, you would have the permit authorizing individual, they would, you, the subcontractor who wants to do the hot work would go to the permit authorizing individual and they would ask them permission to do hot work. And they would ask them in writing in a very specific spot. And they would say, I wanna do, I want to I want to weld some stairs in uh, stairway number three on the third floor, you know, uh, stairwell B or something like that, and they would write it in the log. And then beforehand, the permit authorizing individual would go out there and make sure there's no uh, combustibles around there, move them away, and all that good stuff. And then go back and check while they're doing hot work to make sure they have a fire watch, make sure they have uh, an extinguisher. And then afterwards, they would go back and they would check to make sure that it was all clear and everything was was fine. And so what it would do, it, it really, it holds the, the, uh, the builder accountable for their own hot work. So it's just not going on all over the place. It's, um, to give you an example of how it's done poorly is in New Jersey, there was a big time fire and um, they were doing unpermitted hot work in a wall cavity. So there was no, um, there was no fire watch or anything. And the worker heard a crackling. So did they call the fire department? No, they went to lunch. So did they, when they got back to do the finish uh, up the hot work in the wall, did they, they smell smoke. Did they call the fire department? No, they called their boss. So by the time, uh, they never did call the fire department. It actually burned in the interstitial spaces and the concealed spaces until it burned through a sprinkler pipe which then alerted the fire department. And, um, and they, uh, the fire, the fire department came, but by the time it was such a, a total loss that it was just like uh, nowhere to go from there. So anyway, uh, the fire watch, <clears throat> this is not the guard service fire watch. This is the hot work fire watch. So I don't, I don't want you to get them confused. They can have no other duties. They have to stand there and watch to see where that slag goes. So, and they have the authority to stop the hot work if it seems unsafe. So they have to stay there after the hot work is done. They stay there for the duration of hot work. 
and they have to stay there and maintain it uh, for one hour after the completion of the hot work and for two hours longer for torch apply applied roofing systems. Good luck, because uh, construction managers hate guys standing around doing nothing. But that's what the standard says. It says they're supposed to stay there and watch. And some more proactive companies actually get thermal imaging cameras to see if that slag has gone anywhere to ignite anything. And the reason torch applied roofing systems are longer is because <clears throat> you're basically, you're supposed to cut the pieces, heat them and put them in place. But people don't do that because it takes more time. They just keep it on the big rolls and they, tor they put the torch and they heat the torch and roll it out. And unfortunately they heat it right basically where the torch hits the roof deck, which is plywood a lot of time or OSB. And, and, and if anything catches fire, they just roll the rubber right over it. And if there's any air, it'll smolder and smolder and smolder. And then it will ignite and the fire department's back at three o'clock in the morning with a big time uh, roof fire. Um, electrical, remember we told you that electrical fires make up a lot of property loss uh, on construction site fires. So <clears throat> for some reason, on construction sites, you see people playing fast and loose with temporary wiring. But uh, according to 241, all branch circuits need to originate in an approved power outlet or panel board. All conductors need to be protected with overcurrent devices. Runs of conductors should be located where conductors are not subject to physical damage and they should be fastened, not exceeding 10 feet. Electrical, uh, uh, electrical, electrical devices should, shall be maintained in safe condition. Extension cords should be maintained free of damage. And you need to uh, replace any damaged equipment. But how many times do you see people run over an extension cord and they don't want to throw away a $40 extension cord or a $50? They'll just take it, splice it with electrical tape, and boom, there it goes. Uh, but just, you know, according to the case, you're supposed to throw it away. Uh, temporary lights should be equipped with guards. You shouldn't be dangling uh, lights by their electrical cords. Um, any of the splices should have the, the uh, insulation should be equivalent to that of the cable. Uh, anyway, you should have um, any open any open uh, lens lights should have type O uh, bulbs in them. So if they burst, there's an outer bulb to catch any of that, that the hot arcing. These are just some some bad wiring I saw on construction sites. Here you have to the left, you have that outlet. And uh, it's a, it is a branch circuit, not exactly originating in a panel. And then to the right, you see that uh, open splice is kind of dangling there. Um, and, uh, and this was actually on a site that actually had a fire, believe it or not. Now smoking, there's actually two schools of thought. One school of thought says to ban it completely Another school of thought says to allow it and regulate it. I'm more of the school of thought that says to um, allow it and regulate it because uh, folks are going to do it anyway. And if they do it and you don't regulate it, then they're going to do it in places you don't want them to do it. And they're going to hide it and stick it in shafts and in places you don't want them to. So you're better off regulating it. And those were the requirements, a designated area with the proper receptacles. <clears throat> now cooking, there's the cultural shift in the workforce when it comes to construction and more workers want to cook on site uh, with the bocce's and hot plates and things like that, and save money. And uh, so that's why cooking fires have taken off. And even though cooking, they, they do less than 3% of the property loss, they do account for a third of the civilian injuries uh, that occur on site. So um, this, these are the requirements there. You have a designated area. You still don't allow open flame devices, but you have um, you have designated area away from the building, and you uh, you allow it. So when it comes to uh, equipment, uh, when it comes to equipment, no vehicles should be parked inside of the building. Uh, you make sure that the equipment is cooled down before you, you uh, and there are no leaks before you, if you do bring the building, you make sure they cool down before you refill it and 
all that good stuff. When it comes to waste materials, uh, you should schedule the delivery of materials as close to installation as possible. You, you want to remove your waste materials at the end of every shift as you, if you can. You want to make sure that you never have any open burning of materials. You, you want to prohibit that kind of stuff on site, no burn barrels. I know it's a lot of places want to burn their waste because that's less they have to pay to get hauled away, but you're just asking for trouble uh, by doing that. And with heating equipment, uh, everybody seems to think that all these heaters have these proximity switches, and they do. Uh, it doesn't mean they always work. Um, and the code says you need to make, you need to, these things need to be attended. They, they, even though they're supposed to be secured, they need to be, uh, they, they need to be attended by someone. And when people walk away, they need to turn them off. So um, with combustible material storage, it needs to be as far away from the building as possible, but they don't do that because then uh, there's a security issue. So there were people stealing them. Now, you know, there's pictures of parallel cord trusses, very expensive uh, building material. Uh, they don't want to lose those, so they're going to keep them close to the building, and and sometimes that could be uh, a dangerous situation. Now, this is not a code requirement, except for when it comes to mass timber buildings. They have to be clad with non-combustible cladding when they go up, but this isn't a mass timber building. This is a type, well, this is a uh, podium style with a type one podium with a type um, type three or type five uh, on top of it. This is a podium construction I saw in South Baltimore, as a matter of fact, and I stopped and took a picture of it because this is a very, very conscientious builder. I don't know the name of the builder, but you see some really heavy duty perimeter fencing there. Not only do they have uh, real fencing, they actually have Jersey wall around it. And it's non-combustible cladding uh, going up as the building's going up. And then you see FRTW, uh, fire retardant treated wood, uh, behind that non-combustible cladding. So kudos to them. Uh, when going up, they, they went above the code on that one. It's not required by the code, but they were very serious about their construction fire safety. Unless that was type three, then that would have been required. But the uh, security fencing, the perimeter security certainly isn't required. So passive systems, this is another thing. If you uh, compartmentalization is important in slowing down the fire, and that's why construction fires take off because they're wide open, because they don't have any jip board up, and you have all those open stud cavities, and ventilation really can fuel a fire. Uh, I know LA City was playing around with the idea about requiring uh, fire barriers and firewalls to go uh, up as soon as they were framed out. To, to create those passive systems as soon as they were ready to be closed in. That way it would slow it down. I don't know if that ever got codified. I don't know if they were going to codify that or just pass it as a policy, but uh, that's what they were going to do. This was going to be some of the requirements for that. They were going to require a one-hour fire resistance rating, and uh, they had to protect the openings too. They were also talking about commissioning the system uh, ahead of time, but you can do that in Southern California. You, you, you couldn't do it in the Northeast and a lot of other places because you can't turn the sprinkler system on until the building's conditioned, obviously. Now, when it comes to uh, flammable liquids and gases, people tend to forget that uh, NFPA standards still require proper storage of these things, even if you're on construction sites. People tend to forget that uh, these are still in play and they want to just, um, just, uh, <laughs> stored any which way. I have a picture later on. I want to show you uh, an example of a construction site where they just kind of did anything they wanted with the these mineral spirits. <clears throat> this doesn't really deal with commercial properties too much, but I put it in there because uh, every jurisdiction that I've ever been with, I've had an incident with gas leaks because of improper gas line purging. It's a real problem with one and two family dwellings, not so much with bigger commercial properties, but I always put it in there anyway, just to remind people there is a NFP standard on gas line purging uh, that uh, would help you do it safely and do it the right way. And it's not that hard. So now look at this picture. Here you have mineral spirits, which is highly flammable on an OSB table. They lose the cap to it. So what do they do? 
they stick a wick in it, basically. They take a rubber glove and a napkin. So an OSB table right next to a wooden, I mean, right next to a uh, cardboard box. So anyway, you need to train your workers in the uh, storage and handling of a uh, of flammable liquids. You need signage. You should try to keep your uh, supply down to a couple of days supply if you can. You want to make sure they deal uh, promptly with spills and use uh, the containers they're meant to be stored in and have proper, um, you know, you want to segregate them from obviously ignition sources and you want to use the liquids for their intended purposes. So what does that mean? Uh, did anybody ever have an uncle or grandfather that used to clean car parts with gasoline? Well, that's not the intended purpose of gasoline. So you want to not do that kind of stuff either. Garbage chutes. I told you about the uh, Fairfax County fire. Uh, so uh, garbage chutes that are non-combustible can be located inside. Combustible garbage chutes have to be outside and they also have to be uh, have a test sprinkler head at the top and have to be supplied by at least a three quarter inch diameter hose. It doesn't have to be a commercial hose. I mean, it doesn't have to be a fire hose. It could be a rubber hose. And uh, you wanna make sure you change out that dumpster a lot because you don't want that debris backing up into that chute uh, because uh, somebody can just throw a cigarette in there and boom, off you go. Um, now, when it comes to built-in fire protection features like the fire stairs, say fire protective materials to structural steel and automatic sprinkler systems, you, you really can't uh, count those in because they're usually not really uh, in, in service until the building is nearly done. It's, they're usually like the last things to go online. So those things usually aren't factored into the construction fire safety until towards the end of, <clears throat> of uh, the construction sequence. This is a new provision in, nine, uh, in 241. Uh, you have to have a command post designation, and at the command post, you need emergency uh, uh, plan. I mean, you need plans, you need keys, you have to have access to it, and everybody needs to know where it is. Also, in a new provision to NFPA 241 is that you have to have a knox box, key box. If the site is secure, you need to, to put a key box in there with all of the uh, keys to get anywhere inside that project. Uh, that's a, a new provision in uh, 2000, 2019, new provision. So anyway, the under firefighter access, you, the exterior, okay, this is there's a new construction. You need to have 20 feet of unobstructed width all the way around um, the building within 150 feet of the the first floor. You have to have an all-weather driving sur surface and uh, any dead ends more than 150 feet, you have to have a turnaround. So also you need to have uh, 13 and a half feet of unobstructed height. So about all-weather driving surface, that could be crush and run, it could be anything that the jurisdiction tells you that it is. Now, uh, a friend of mine from West Des Moines, Iowa, he's the fire marshal out there, on a, a Friday, the contractor came to him and said, listen, I pull up this crush and run. He had the curbs and gutters in, but didn't have the, the concrete in because they didn't want to mess up the, the concrete with uh, their big heavy equipment. So they're getting the concrete poured on Monday. So he says, can I pull up this crush and run? Because I got trucks coming on Monday and I really don't want to waste time. I just want to pour it. And being the nice guy he is, he says, sure. So they pull it up on Friday and it rained all weekend long. It rained Saturday, it rained Sunday. And Sunday night, which happened to be Easter Sunday, they get a fire. And he told me all of the fire trucks sank down to their axles in mud, the place caught fire and um, it was a mess, it was a big mess. And so he's trying to be a nice guy. I probably would have let him do it too, but it, sometimes it just goes bad. But with stairs, you have to have at least one usable stair go up with the, as the building goes up. It has to be lighted, it has to be marked. But like I said, LA City said if all the usable stair, all the stairs you're going to have have to be usable. They all have to go with the building, but the code only requires one. Uh, hydrants, uh, they have to be uh, free access. Here you have a roll-off dumpster blocking the hydrant, but um, uh, they they have to be accessible. 
Because like I said, you have to be, you have to have that, uh, the water supply, it does no good to have a hydrant that you can't get to. You, you, uh, I had a building inspector who was a volunteer firefighter and if he went onto a job site and saw a, any hydrant that was being blocked, he would issue a stop work order. So consequently, no hydrants in his district were ever blocked on his construction sites. Stand pipes where required. These are simply the most important fire protection um, feature on a construction site. It is the quickest way to convey water to the upper floors of a uh, of a place under construction until the sprinkler system goes on fine. They have to be, uh, it goes up with the building. Once the building hits 40 feet, it has to be uh, the, the FDC has to be conspicuously marked. There has to be a, a hose outlet on each floor. The minimum water supply must be 500 gallons a minute per the IFC. Um, uh, this is a picture of the debris, which is not supposed to be there uh, in the uh, stair tower, but uh, it has to go up with the building. Once it hits 40 feet, everything has to work as it goes up. This is a picture of the temp FDC. Before uh, the water supply, the NFPA 241 gives you no uh, guidance on it. It just says that it has to be there once combustible materials get on site. Now, uh, the IFC used to give you no guidance. Now it gives you guidance for uh, the standpipe, and it does give you some guidance uh, on the minimum fire flow regarding how far you are from property lot lines and adjacent buildings. Uh, but still, it's very little guidance, but it is some guidance. Now you can always say, is it enough water or not? That's another, that's another, uh, you know, debate, you know. And then there's also local examples like this one I found. But, you, like, you know, how much is enough water? These, these places are huge. They go up very quickly. Uh, when I was a building official in the city of Rockville, Maryland, we had a huge construction site fire at a place called 40 Upper Rock. It actually made CNN news because it closed I-270, a major artery going into DC. Uh, the Montgomery County, Maryland fire chief told me they had five units flowing as much as 5,000 gallons a minute, 25,000 gallons a minute. I don't know how many people could generate that kind of fire flow. This was actually started uh, at an upper floor by a salamander that was left turned on all week long. That was, um, it was, it set a combustible debris on fire because there was no housekeeping uh, there and a, and a guard service that didn't patrol. So it was a perfect storm of just everything you don't want to do. Uh, Avalon Bay has a fire elimination plan where they do site security. Uh, they, they have a source of uh, ignition reduction and detection. So what they do is they do a uh, source of ignition reduction. They do bolt on stairs instead of welded stairs. They do uh, pressure fittings instead of brace fittings where the code allows it. They do site security and they do Wi-Fi enabled remote sensors all above the code. That nothing that's required by the code, but they these uh, remote sensors are uh, you can rent them and they, they have different channels of data they collect heat heat rate of rise humidity smoke and that kind of stuff and because they're wi-fi enabled they can send that information to any device so in the last i don't know 20 minutes i'm just going to go over new provisions of the of uh, nfp 241 of the ifc just to uh, refresh everybody's memory some of these provisions in 241 uh, are the ads definitions, uh, electrical service disconnecting means, guard service requirements, command post and key box requirements, tall mass timber building construction requirements. Um, so one of the things the new 241 does is it has new requirements for tall mass timber buildings that uh, were allowed under the 2021 edition of the IBC. So because they added these provisions, 
they have to add definitions for cross-laminated timber. So that's what this does in 241. <clears throat> it also has to add a definition the, uh, to, for critical heat flux because it has a requirement in their four mass timber buildings and critical heat flux is part of that requirement. Um, they also <clears throat> add a definition for facility fire brigade. They, um, now the next uh, change is the electrical service disconnecting means, which I think is a really good firefighter safety provision. This means that you have to have one way to shut off all of your electricity uh, on a job site. That way, the fire service, if they have to go fight a fire, they know that everything is shut down, so they, it's safe to throw water. No firefighter is going to get electrocuted. It's just like uh, the provision in permanent buildings. There's one shot off in all commercial buildings. There's one shot off in all residential buildings. So they can ensure firefighter safety. There's also <clears throat> a new guard service uh, requirement uh, where buildings of combustible construction exposed during construction. I told you about this 40 feet. Uh, 40 feet above grade plane are going to be um, going to be required when no crews are on site, and they have a new standard for guard service, which is NFPA 160. I mean, sorry, 16, 601. There's actually a standard for the guard service. Uh, I think NFPA has a standard. NFPA has a standard for pretty much everything. Uh, this is the command post and key box requirement that I talked about earlier. Uh, so in the the command post, the designate, designated command post, you have to have emergency information, plans, keys, everybody doesn't know where it is. The, the responsible person for that job site needs to show up there when there's an emergency to meet the incident commander for the fire department, uh, the first responders rather, and the first the incident commander will have everything they need. So these are the new requirements for tall mass timber buildings in uh, the NFPA. So you need a fire exposure analysis, and uh, the results of that will determine the level of protection you need during construction. What is a fire exposure analysis? Well, I ask members of the committee, uh, which I'm on the committee now. I wasn't on the committee when this was put in. Basically, a risk assessment. So I said, well, why don't you just call it a risk assessment? Uh, Nobody had a great answer for me, but uh, I think maybe because fire exposure analysis sounds fancier, but uh, it's basically a risk assessment. Now, there is a guard service <clears throat> requirement for tall mass timber buildings, and uh, that's all times uh, that uh, workers are not on site. So this is always a requirement for mass to tall mass timber buildings. Also, there is a six-foot high construction fence required on all tall mass timber buildings uh, all the time. So those are your new provisions in NFPA 241 to, to 2019 edition. Now I'm going to preview you for whatever reason, well, not for whatever reason, there is a 2022 edition of NFPA 241 coming out that, um, that I think they want to get lined up with the NFPA 1 code cycle. I think that's why they're doing turning around so quick. And that that is going to feature uh, a similar a similar requirement for six high fencing six foot high fencing around podium construction, uh, as well as the guard service, uh, just like mass timber construction. I think that's the big change. So here's the new construction fire safety provisions for the 2021 IFC. Uh, this is already out and they include the daily fire safety inspection, which is something that I, I am really in favor of. That's not for uh, municipalities to do. It's an it's a internal inspection, a self-inspection as it were. Fire watch requirements, cooking separation requirements, uh, site safety plan requirements, site safety director responsibilities, tall mass timber construction fire safety requirements. These are all the new requirements for the, that are in the 2021 IFC. I think the most meaningful one of the bunch is the daily fire safety inspection. 
and that is required. Uh, it requires the site safety director to conduct a daily fire safety inspection at the project site. Um, so, and, and this isn't an owner's thing. It's basically a walkthrough, which I think they should be doing every day anyway. They need to know what's going on in their job site for a lot of reasons. So the site safety director has to walk the site every day, inside and out, and this has to occur every day until the certificate of occupancy is issued. They have to document it. They need to um, keep records of this and they have to present it to the fire official when asked and if they can't do it three times in a row. The fire official can issue a stop work order. And uh, this actually gives some teeth to it. In most jurisdictions, the, the uh, fire officials usually cannot issue stop work orders. Uh, only the building officials can. So this gives uh, a little teeth to that uh, program. So these are some of the areas that you would expect they would have to look at. The hot work areas, temp heating areas, um, ensure trash and debris are removed, temporary wiring doesn't have exposed conductors, look at flammable uh, liquid and hazard materials are being stored properly. These all should sound pretty familiar. Uh, requirements of the daily spell inspection also include that hydrants are clearly visible, inspect uh, fire access, make sure it's free of obstructions. And like I said, uh, 20 feet of unobstructed width for fire engines, not a 20 foot road that you park stuff on the east side, 20 feet of unobstructed width. Um, it, it's where standpipes are in service and go up with the building one floor above the uh, highest, one floor below the highest floor of construction. Uh, portable fire extinguishers are in service and properly spaced. And one thing I wanted to say about the whole issue of fire extinguishers, that's, I don't know how to feel about the whole fire extinguisher debate. People, uh, it, it, if I'm all for putting fire extinguishers all over the place, as long as people are properly trained and know when and when not to use them. Back to the College Park fire that I talked about in the beginning, I was at that fire um, while it was still going on. Afterwards, I talked to the uh, Prince George's County Fire Marshal's Office and the Maryland State Fire Marshal's Office who investigated it. They found like 12 expended fire extinguishers at the point of origin, okay? Some people, instead of calling 911, try to put that thing out. And, and you need to tell, you need to train your crew, if you can't put it out with one extinguisher, you can't put it out with 12. And they wasted all that time. Just a little side commentary. So another thing in the, um, the IFC 2021 edition uh, that is, um, that's coming is a fire watch requirement, very much similar to what is in the 2019 NFP 241 with one difference. The fire watch is triggered at 40 feet in height, just like the fire watch in 241. However, it also includes an aggregate area of 50,000 square feet. It's not 40 feet and 50,000 square feet of aggregate area. It's 40 feet in height above grade plane or 50,000 feet in aggregate floor area. Now the 2022 edition of uh, 241 is going to include the, the 50,000 uh, square feet of aggregate floor area as well. I think 241 and IFC chapter 33 are really trying to sync up their codes. So, um, they, they match each other uh, very, very much uh, similar to each other. Okay, uh, fire watch requirements. Uh, this is for the guard service fire watch. The fire watch personnel must be trained in the use of portable extinguishers and fire reporting. The fire watch must have at least one means to notify the fire department. And they have to, you know, uh, keep a record of patrols and logs and things like that. And I told you a little bit about the Rockville fire where they had a guard service, but the guard service didn't patrol. So that heater ran from Friday when that when those, when those folks left up in that upper floor all weekend long and uh, caught the debris on fire and it burned up into the roof and the roof had a dry sprinkler system. They got what? The dry sprinkler system wasn't turned on. It was working, it, it, it had been approved, but it was a very cold March. So they didn't want to turn that dry system on because they thought that if a head got knocked off 
um, or in the wet system that was that could have been turned on. And even though that the building was conditioned, it wasn't that far away from uh, a CFO, that if a pipe broke or a contractor knocked the head off, the, the sprinkler system wasn't yet tied into the alarm. So they were afraid that the water would run, it would do tens of thousands of dollars damage. Well, because of the, uh, the fire getting into that roof system and not having a sprinkler system to put it out, it did tens of millions of dollars. I think that was a 32 or $35 million loss. So the IFC also has a cooking separation requirement. So you have to be at least 10 feet away from combustible materials with signage that prohibits uh, cooking within 10 feet of, uh, of the building and you have to have an area and all this stuff. You also have to have a site safety plan. I love this requirement. It's now required, it must be submitted prior to the issuance of a building permit. And what I love about this one is because before, you know, once a builder gets that permit in their hand, getting anything out of them paperwork wise is so difficult, especially from a fire department perspective. I mean, once they can put the shovels in the dirt, it is like getting point teeth, uh, getting anything out of them. But if you have that building permit you're holding over their head, man, they'll give you anything to get that building permit going. And if they have to give you that safety plan, it has to be approved before. And they, so they need that site safety plan with their original submittal. You're gonna get it and they're gonna make sure it's right because they want that building permit. So these are some of the things that need to be in that building permit. I mean, I'm sorry, the site safety plan, you know, the training, procedures for emergency notification, you know, cooking policy, site security policy, all the things that, you know, 241 um, uh, talks about and, and that I've talked about in this, uh, in this plan. And, and I'm sorry, in this, uh, this PowerPoint here today. And uh, so these all should look familiar. There's nothing here that we haven't already discussed. You know, it should be housekeeping and it should be uh, site security and it should be hot work and all this stuff. Now, it, the code is famous for having requirements and not telling you anything about the requirement. So this is a requirement for site safety director training requirement. All it says is that the site safety director must have qualifications specific to their roles and responsibility. So the training and qualifications must be made available to the fire official upon request. So, it, but it tells you nothing. It doesn't tell you they need to have fire inspector one, or they need to have firefighter one, or they have to be a active retired fire marshal or building inspector or, or any, it tells you nothing. Or safety officer, it tells you nothing. Just specific to their roles and responsibility. So I, I try to aid people in, you know, trying to standardize this. So the National Association of State Fire Marshals, who I am not a member of, I have no affiliation with at all, just to let you know, I'm not trying to hawk anything. They have a self-paced uh, online uh, course on construction fire safety. And it's grounded in, I believe, NFP, well, I, I don't, it's NFP 241 in the codes. And it covers all the things I've covered, but in greater detail. And you go on there and you can go all the way through it. And I think you can get a certificate. It's not a certification, but I think you do get a certificate at the end of it. But it is excellent. I know because I took it because they use some of my photos. So I got to look through it before I signed off on them using photos I gave them. So, you know, I would say, hey, check it out. It's the National Association of State Fire Marshals. It's online. It's an excellent program. And um, I, I think that would uh, be a good place for, uh, and they have it geared not just to firefighters. They have it geared towards, they have one program for, I think, workers, one for, like, uh, I guess, the fire prevention managers, for, you know, the site safety directors or whomever. But they have different programs for different, sorts of folks. So I definitely would say that is uh, a worthwhile uh, program. But uh, 
the new requirement uh, also lays out uh, the site safety director responsibilities. So these shouldn't look like any, uh, it shouldn't look new to you, insurance compliance with the site safety plan, responsible for the guard service, fire watch personnel, hot work, plan impairment, uh, impairments, uh, maintaining their records and all this stuff, you know, nothing that, nothing here should be new. We talked about it when we talked about uh, 241 and, and all the, the uh, fire prevention program manager, they call it in 241 in IFC, a site safety director. Here's the mass timber construction fire safety requirements. This is all for type 4A, B, and C construction. And if you are regular AWC webinar attendees, I don't have to explain those construction types to you. But you know you have to have your standpipes. You have to have a, a water supply approved by the fire chief. Um, <clears throat> so where the building exceeds uh, six stories above grade plane, which would be all tall mass timber buildings, because it's not a tall mass timber building until it goes above six stories, um, you have to have non-combustible protection, at least one layer. So it would be one layer of type X 5/8 gypsum wallboard. Uh, go on the inside where it requires it on the inside, which would be type 4A or B, and on the outside um, as the building goes up within four stories, I'm sorry, within four stories of the lowest floor of active construction. So as the building goes up, the non-combustible protection goes up with the building. So when the two, I mean, sorry, 241, when the TWB, the Tallwood Building Ad Hoc Committee was deliberating, the Grenfell Towers fire in London happened. This fire was at a fire in a fourth floor apartment, I believe it was, and it burned out of the apartment and it had combustible cladding. Actually, it, was, uh, the, it wasn't the cladding itself, it was in between at an air gap with uh, combustible foam. And it went up the face of the building, went into other apartments, killed like 70 some people. So they said, well, oh, these mass timber buildings have to have non-combustible cladding. So all mass timber buildings have to have non-combustible cladding and it has to go up as the building goes up. And on the inside, where required in type 4A and type 4B, it has to go up with the building on the inside as well. Type 4C, it doesn't because you can expose all the mass timber, but those buildings only go to nine stories. Now I'm gonna to try to play this video. It's of the first arriving unit in uh, Fairfax, the Fairfax fire. If I can play it great, it just illustrates how um, fast these fires take off. So uh, basically when the first arriving units uh, get on scene, you see fire blowing out of the, the um, uh, just two windows of a unit. So As they pull up, you can actually see the front of the um, the front face of the building where the garbage chute was. You can even see it scarring. I, I think you can see still. It's like a series of still pictures. The Fairfax County, the first arriving unit, saw fire blowing out of two windows. And eight minutes later, they saw this. But um, these were some of the learning objectives that we had at the beginning, and um, I think we covered all of these. And what is uh, Predictable is what's preventable. I think every one of these fires is 100% preventable. And even when they do occur, I think if you, if these provisions are enforced, they will be small in scope in nature. And if uh, they are enforced and if they do occur. So, um, and if there are any questions, I will take them. No, oh, yeah, we've got quite a few questions here. So we'll Great. go ahead and and jump into those right away. Uh, so our first question, Ray, is related to, you talked about NFPA 241, um, I think specifically chapter seven, and then IFC uh, 3308. Well, actually, um, I talked about all, all of chapter. Okay. The, oh, oh, he's talking about a specific section. Oh, yeah, 241, well, the, uh, the, yeah. Yeah, the, I think the question is, um, are both of these standards referenced in in the IBC um, 
or is it an either or how how would people know which standard that they should comply with i guess is the the short way of phrasing it well if you are you if you're operating this is this is what standard you would comply with if you adopt the entire family of i codes you would comply with the ifc uh chapter 33. if you adopt the entire family of i codes except for the isc and you're an nfpa chapter i mean fire code jurisdiction you would comply with nfpa 241. i mean uh, okay. yeah because you would adopt yeah. nfp1 which is uh which references 241. but even if you're an isc jurisdiction you would do two you would do chapter 33 but if 241 requires something that IFC doesn't, then two, you could bring 241 into to enforce that requirement. Mm -hmm. um, so is is there? I guess another question that just came in then. So is there a specific reference in the IBC to either NFPA 241 or um, the IFC? Yes, there's a specific reference in IBC to IFC. Okay, great. All right. Um, here's a, a good question. I know you had talked about uh, how I believe it was fire fire safety plans are are required for all dwellings per. Uh, I, if I try to remember which standard you cited, I'll mess it up. But I think two forty one. Yeah. So um, all structures on, under under NFPA two forty one would be required to have a fire safety plan. Are there all, instances all where structures it, under all, all all construction alteration or demolition projects? All right, okay. Um, would the are these typically applied to single family dwellings uh, or or buildings of that nature? So you know, people are asking. I would say, you know, even though they technically are, I would say no, not for one, but for a development, I'd say yes. Mm -hmm. Right. But so I have seen jurisdictions. That, I have seen yeah. jurisdictions that hand out one pagers and say, "Here, fill in the blanks and staple it to, you know, or tape it to your, you know, next to your permit." Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, okay, so here's a question related to liability. Um, if a building owner implements a fire safety program, is it on them or on the GC to enforce the requirements of that? It's ultimately on the owner. Okay. And and we talk about liability, and and this is actually right. a, a, an interesting question, and because I was in Boston last month at the NFPA conference on a panel discussion with the insurance industry, and 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 I'm a lawyer, <laughs> uh, so there's it, it, two types of liability. You're talking about the legal liability. Are we talking about the like the, the monetary legal liability are we talking about uh like the liability when it comes to government violations because um uh, when it comes to who's who the insurance company is going to pay off you know it, it really depends on the builder's risk it, you know it, who's underwriting the policy and is the gc getting the policy underwritten so that means the the builders risk the builders getting the policy to, to pay off whatever you know that the place burns down it's the builder that's getting the money to pay because the builder's paying the premium or you're talking about if something happens and there's violations written it'll be the owner that would bear that viability okay and uh, yeah that that uh legal background you have certainly brings a, a great uh, element into your your analysis on that that's a real benefit of your expertise on uh, both sides of, of the uh, the code book shall we say uh, we have a question on standpipes okay this is kind of a practical question so it's not really in the code but um, 
are there so, so you've got a building under construction you've got your standpipe active in a portion of it are there provisions for keeping that from freezing while the building is under construction or it would be a dry standpipe so, okay so that wouldn't be an issue excellent um here's a oh here's a really good question so this one what do you think is the most important thing a building inspector can do to minimize fire risks? Uh, I think the, I would say, the, I would say the, well, two, well, two things that are kind of one thing. Make sure that ignition sources are segregated from sources of fuel. So, keep housekeeping or, or, you know, make sure that places are kept clean. Not, you know, I'm not talking about clean, like clean in the sense that they're scrubbed down. I mean, like if there's a lot of scrap around, make sure they are, that, that the scrap is put away. Like the bound for, the thing I didn't talk about, because I, uh, the, the slides were uh, lagging so much, it was throwing me off, is in Boundbrook, New Jersey, that arsonist, he, pushed a weighted, a, a, a flimsy uh, fence aside. He walked up a back stairwell to the first floor above the podium and by happenstance walked into a unit that they called the scrap room. So they had, this was gonna be apartments above the podium. They had one apartment they dedicated just for scrap, which is, I've never heard of that. Okay, and just by dumb luck, he walks into it. So they had provided this arsonist with all the fuel in the world he could have wanted or needed to light this place up. And I just never heard of that. I've never been on construction site where they, instead of having a dumpster, they had a scrap room. And you know, the like you know, they keep stuff from like that happening. Um, and uh, this, if you see piles of stuff laying around, just have them get rid of it. Or if you see, uh, like, like I, I, you see bad wiring, because electrical is such a big deal. Th those are the things that I would look at as a building inspector and go, this has got to go. Or like my building inspector in Rockville, the, the volunteer firefighter would say, hey, you're blocking the hydrants there. You're blocking the roads. Clear it out. Absolutely. And I, I think the, you know, the overarching message also that you've, I've heard you express on numerous occasions is that, that fire safety is, is ultimately everyone's responsibility. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's up to everyone to help maintain and point out things on job sites that, that could be hazardous. So, all right. Um, Here's a question. Are there any requirements to have sprinkler heads inside of garbage chutes? Yes. On okay. Not on construction site. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, if they're combustible. Mm -hmm. I thought, I thought they were talking about permanent garbage chutes. There's a, only so much nuance that we get on the questions in, in our question box here. So um, here, okay. Here's uh, a pretty detailed question. Uh, uh, our uh, attendee writes that their jurisdiction is seeing an increase in requests for phased occupancy of buildings under construction, including R2 apartment buildings, and the IBC and IFC don't appear to include direct provisions for phased occupancy. Can you provide any guidance from your experience? Is there any code development or any provisions in the IFC or IBC for phased occupancies? I could tell you, and I'll have to look, we had a policy, um, a um, sample policy from, I wanna say Ottawa, Canada, for their phased occupancy policy on the Construction Fire Safety Coalition website. I have to look look again because we, we moved some stuff around in there. I wanna see if it's still there. But I can tell you what we did in Baltimore City and in Rockville, uh, because nobody wants to build a hotel or an apartment building and wait till the last unit is finished before they start selling units or renting units. So phase occupancy goes on all over the place. So in Baltimore we'll, and in Rockville, we did the same thing. We had like basically two requirements. 
we required an hour of separation between the act of construction and the the, uh, the occupied spaces, and we required all of the fire protection systems to be in service. You know, the sprinkler and the, um, the fire alarm and all that stuff in the occupied spaces. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Okay. We've got a few questions still coming in here. And it might have been two hours of separation. I can't remember. It might have been two yeah. hours. Yeah. Because that would be a separate building. Right. Okay. Um, here's a question. This one might make more sense to you, Ray. Do, do you see the supervisory, the air requirement on standpipes or enforce it at at construction sites, the supervisory air requirement on standpipes is that? See, it's it's an, it's it's yeah. it's a dry pipe system, but not in the sense. Okay, it's it's not a uh, dry pipe in the sense that it's hooked to water, and when you uh, open, when it it gets open, it gets it gets, it becomes a wet system. It's a pure dry system. It's, it just has an FDC and it go and a dry pipe system. So there's no supervisory air in the system. It's not like a dry sprinkler system where a head activates and it fills with water and then and it charges the head. It's just the fire department is the water supply for it. So when the fire department pulls up, they hook to the FDC and charge the system. So there's no supervisory air like you would see for a a um a dry sprinkler system all right all right uh i think we have time for one more question really quickly and then we will bounce it back to marcy to close this out so let's see um here's a question related to uh adjacent buildings or properties um are there how to how to protect adjacent buildings or properties from a, is there a requirement from a code standpoint? Um, there's no special requirement other than in the IFC. Uh, I, I alluded to about the water requirement. As if you're building combustible construction, which would be type um, uh, uh, three, four, or five, the water supply requirement it deals with uh, separation distances. So if you're within 30 feet, you have to have either 500 gallons or 100% of the fire flow of the completed building, whatever's greater. If you're 30 to 60 feet, it's 500 gallons or 50% of the uh, fire flow uh, of the completed building, whatever's greater. And if you're 60 feet or farther, it's just 500 gallons a minute. Uh, so, um, that's the only thing that has to do with surrounding buildings. And that's uh, from not even adjacent buildings, it's adjacent buildings, lot lines, or potentially places where people could build. So, okay. But there's nothing. That's why, that's why it's so important for uh, incident commanders when they pull up to assess whether they can even save the buildings. The, the fire in Denver, the incident commander did such a great job. When she pulled up, she knew that building couldn't be saved. And she trained most of her water on the surrounding buildings and saved them all. All right. All right. Well, we are at the half hour. So thank you very much, Ray, for that very informative and excellent talk.